On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Robert Mugabe, President of the Republic of Zimbabwe, and, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Your Excellency, Mr. Vuk Jeremich, President of the 67th Session of the United Nations General Assembly, Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Your Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Sec Secretary General of the United Nations, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my delegation and on my own behalf, may I extend to Your Excellency, Mr. Jeremich, our warmest congratulations on your re election as the President of the 67th Session of the United Nations General Assembly. Your extensive experience in both regional and international affairs will undoubtedly enrich the debate and proceedings during this session. I wish to assure you of the full cooperation of Zimbabwe as you discharge the onerous duties of this high office. Mr. President, if you might allow me, may I preface my speech with reference to the most glowing and most moving speech address we we'll listened to from the President of the United States yesterday, the import of which was to get us to condemn the death, the tragic death of the United States Ambassador to Libya. And I'm sure we were all moved. We all agree that it, it was a tragic death indeed, and we condemn it. But, uh, Mr. Ch President, Ladies and gentlemen, a year ago, we saw a barbaric and brutal death of the head of state of Libya, a representative of his country, a member of the African Union. that death occurred in the context in which NATO was operating supposedly in order to protect civilians. As we in spirit join the United States in condemning that death, Shall the United States also join us in condemning that barbaric death of the head of state of Libya, Gaddafi? It was a loss, a great loss to Africa, a tragic loss to Africa occurring in circumstances in which NATO had sought the authority of the United Nations Security Council under Chapter 7 to operate in Libya in protection of civilians who were said to be at the mercy of the government of Libya led by Colonel Gaddafi. The mission was strictly to protect civilians. 
but it turned out that there was a hunt, a brutal hunt of Gaddafi and his family. And Gaddafi and his family were sought NATO caught up with them. They suffered the brutal deaths that we know about, Gaddafi and some of his children. And as the United States spoke, I'm sure they were aware also that they were a NATO power that they, alongside other NATO powers, had had the authority under Chapter 7 to operate in protection in Libya, in protection of civilians. But did it turn out to be that? In a very dishonest manner, we saw Chapter 7 the authority given at, up under Chapter 7 being used now as a weapon to rout a whole family, to commit the murders that occurred in the country. Bombs were th thrust, were thrown about in a callous manner and quite a good many civilians died. Was that the protection that they had sought under Chapter 7 of the Charter? So, the death of Gaddafi must be seen as in the same tragic manner as the death of Chris Stevens. We condemn both of them. Let me begin by reaffirming the rightful and important role of the United Nations in the management of issues affecting international peace and security. In the quest for a more just and equitable international order, Zimbabwe remains strongly opposed to unilateralism and is committed to multilateralism. We therefore would like to see a United Nations that continues to be a guarantor of world peace and security and a bulwark in the fight for justice and equality among nations. It behoves us all, therefore, to take the necessary steps to ensure that the United Nations is not marginalized on international issues. Equally important, the United Nations must in future never allow itself to be abused as it was in the case I've referred to where NATO sought under Chapter 7 authority to protect civilians and nay, it did not turn to be that. Nations must in future never allow itself to be abused. The United Nations Security Council must never in future allow itself to be abused by any member state or group of states that seeks to achieve parochial partisan goals. The Charter of the United Nations clearly stipulates that it is as an international body that should work for the good of all the peoples of the world big and small. Mr. President, we recognize that there are existing and emerging threats and challenges that continue to frustrate our individual and collective efforts to attain greater economic development and social progress, as well as peace and security. 
by the increasing trend by the NATO states inspired by the arrogant belief that they are the most powerful among us, which has demonstrated itself through their recent resort to unilateralism and military hegemony in Libya, is the very antithesis of the basic principles of the United Nations. In that case of Libya, the African Union and its peacemaking role was defied, ignored and humiliated. The African Union was for dialogue between the Libyan Authority and the so-called revolutionaries. May we urge the international community to collectively nip this dangerous and unwelcome aggressive development before it festers. In this regard, Mr. President, the theme you have chosen this session, for this session, namely, and I quote, bringing about adjustment or settlement of international disputes or situ situations by peaceful means, unquote, is very appropriate. And this is what we in the African Union stress, settlement of disputes in a peaceful way, through dialogue. The war mongers of our world have done us enough harm. Wherever they have imposed themselves, chaos in place of peace has been the result. The situation created by the Bush Blair illegal campaign in Iraq illegal campaign undertaken because it was alleged that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction when it was well known to these two and their governments that he did not have such weapons. And indeed, after invading Iraq, doing lots of havoc and getting rid of Saddam Hussein, they admitted that he had no weapons of mass destruction. And so why had they, in the first place, attacked Iraq? Why did they seek to get rid of Saddam Hussein? Was it merely because he was a dictator, as they alleged? No. He was head of a country which sat on tons and tons of oil. It was oil they required. And we saw companies rushing. Indeed, one company was headed by the brother of Bush rushing to suck oil from Iraq. And this is what happened also in regard to, to Libya. The situation created, they created in Iraq has now brought about greater instability than there ever was. You have the Sunnis, rising against Shiites, vice versa, let alone the disastrous economic consequences of that unlawful invasion. The economy is unstable, society unstable, people fighting each other. Libya has been made equally unstable following NATO's deceitful intervention under the sham cover of Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations and the phony principle of the responsibility to protect. I listened to the speech made by the Secretary General. He made reference to this principle 
is a principle that can be abused and has been abused. And in any way, it is still being debated. Mr. President, Zimbabwe firmly believes in the peaceful settlement of disputes between and among states in a manner that is consistent with the principles and purposes of the United Nations. In the maintenance of international peace and security, much more needs to be done to prevent conflicts from erupting in the first place and to prevent relapses once a situation has been stabilized. Beyond deploying adequate resources to manage conflicts, it is important to address their underlying causes and to pursue more proactively a comprehensive approach focusing on conflict prevention, peace building, peace sustenance, and development. In pursuing this cause, my delegation strongly believes that adherence to the Charter of the United Nations should be a solemn obligation of all member states. Mr. President, we have noticed with deep regret that the provisions of the United Nations Charter dealing with a peaceful settlement of disputes have on occasion been ignored by the Security Council. In contrast, there appears to be an insatiable appetite for war, embargoes, sanctions, and other punitive actions, even on matters that are better resolved through multilateral cooperation and dialogue. Instead of resorting to the peaceful resolution of disputes, we are daily witnessing a situation where might is now right. And we have said, well, those who are powerful, yes, might hang on the principle that might is right. But certainly, right is also might. Mr. President, we need to take stock of the inspiring preamble to the United Nations Charter, where the plenipotentiaries who met in San Francisco in 1945 undertook, and I quote, to save, and succeeding, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, unquote. This is especially so when global events represent a radical departure from that solemn and noble San Francisco Declaration as is happening at present. What do the NATO Alliance members say about this? One may ask. Mr. President, it is therefore important that the United Nations Security Council should respect and support the decisions, processes, and priorities of regional organizations. In contrast, recent events, as has already been stated, particularly with reference to Africa, have demonstrated this scant regard that is given by the United Nations and certain powerful members of the international community to the pivotal role of regional organizations. Effective cooperation between the United Nations and regional organizations will only become viable and sustainable when developed on the basis of mutual respect and support, as well as on shared responsibility and commitment. Mr. President, it is regrettable to note that certain unacceptable concepts are currently being foisted upon the United Nations membership in the absence of intergovernmental mandates. For instance, there is no agreement yet on the concept of responsibility to protect, especially with respect to the circumstances under which it might be evoked. We are concerned by the clear and growing evidence that the concept of responsibility to protect 
has begun to be applied and seriously abused, thus inevitably compromising and undermining the cardinal principle of the sovereignty of states and the United Nations Charter principles of territorial integrity and non-interference in the domestic affairs of countries. Mr. President, for the international community to successfully deal with global economic, social, security and environmental challenges, the existence of international institutions to handle them and a culture of genuine multilateralism are critical. The United Nations, its specialized agencies and international financial institutions are the only instruments available for responding effectively to the global challenges we face in this global village. It is therefore critical that these structures are reformed and realigned in response to both global challenges and our contemporary realities in order to enable them to better serve our collective interests. Mr. President, this August Assembly is the most representative organ within the United Nations family. We must therefore dedicate ourselves to finding consensus on measures to revitalize it so that it fulfills its mandate in accordance with the provisions of the Charter. We wish to reiterate our deep concern that the mandate power, the mandate powers and jurisdiction of the General Assembly are shrinking as a consequence of the Security Council gradually encroaching on the Assembly's areas of competence. This is, in our view, this, in our view, upsets the delicate balance envisaged under the Charter and undermines the overall effectiveness of the United Nations system, the General Assembly must remain the main deliberative policy-making organ of the United Nations. Mr. President, we have been seized with a debate on the reform of the Security Council for far too long. My delegation fully supports the current intergovernmental negotiations on the reform and expansion of the Security Council. However, we wish to caution against an open-ended approach which shortchanges those of us from regions that are not represented at all among the permanent membership of the Council. Zimbabwe stands by Africa's demand for two permanent seats complete with a veto if the veto is to be retained, plus two additional non-permanent seats as clearly articulated in the Ezulwini Consensus and the Surte Declaration. For how long, Mr. President, will the international community continue to ignore the aspirations of a whole continent of 54 countries? We shall not be bought off with empty promises, nor shall we accept some cosmetic tinkering of the Security Council disguised as reform. It is indeed a travesty of justice that the African continent which accounts for almost a third of the membership represented in this august assembly has no permanent representation in the Security Council. Is this good governance at all? Is this democracy? And is it justice? My delegation condemns unreservedly the economic sanctions imposed against my country and people in an unjustified effort to deny them the chance to fully benefit from their natural resource endowment. We wish to remind those who have maintained sanctions against us that there is international consensus fully supported by the Southern African Development Community, the African Union, and 
the non-aligned movement and the rest of the progressive common, the, the progressive world that these sanctions must go. And we hope that the sanctions, Mr. Chairman, will go. Now allow me, Mr. Chairman, to conclude by reaffirming Zimbabwe's commitment to the principles that have brought us together in the United Nations for the last 67 years. My country is confident that in this inextricably interdependent world, our commitment to the common good, which, is this, organi which this organization on embodies will be resolute and enduring. Zimbabwe will continue to stand firm and to condemn unilateralism, the imposition of unwarranted and illegal sanctions on nations and the unwarranted extraterritorial application of national laws. I thank you for listening to me.